Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here again today to talk to you about common conditions of the spine that can cause pain and discomfort. Are you starting to notice you're dropping things more often? Having trouble buttoning the buttons to your shirt or blouse? Do you feel that you're off balance or feel that you're walking on a boat? These are subtle symptoms that many people chalk up to just getting older. While that may sometimes be the case, it could also possibly be compression of your spinal cord, which slows down the transmission of signals from your brain to other parts of your body. These symptoms are what we in the spine surgery community call cervical myelopathy. And that's the overview for the video today. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, now that we're in, let's talk about our discussion for today, cervical myelopathy. Before we get into the symptoms and causes of cervical radiculopathy, we should have a little bit of an understanding of what normal MRI anatomy is. This is going to be what we're going to be looking at together when you come in for a consultation. This is going to be a view from the side as if we cut you right down the middle of your body, so there is no left and right. If you're looking at the MRI image here, the front of your body is going to be here on the left side of the screen. This is going to be where your mouth and throat are. Over on the left side of the screen, this is going to be the skin of your back, just for your orientation. In blue are going to be your muscles and your spinous processes of the back of your neck. So when you're touching the back of your neck, that bone that you feel, that's going to be your spinous processes. The vertebral bodies are the building blocks that make up your spinal column. These are highlighted here in red. You have seven vertebrae in your cervical spine, numbered one through seven. In between the vertebrae are going to be the discs. The discs are a rubbery type substance which gives cushion between the vertebrae. Now, if you're looking closely though here, this is going to be the base of your brain stem. And coming down from your brain stem in gray is going to be the spinal cord. This is going to be highlighted in green for us right now. And if you notice on either side of the spinal cord, you have white. That white is spinal fluid. Spinal fluid gives nutrients to the spinal cord to make sure that it stays healthy. Now let's move on to the top view. What this is, is it's a cross section through your neck. So instead of the previous view where we cut you right down the middle, this view, we're cutting you in half. So if you pay close attention, the top part of the picture here is going to be where the front of your body is, and the bottom part of the picture here is going to be where the back of your neck is. Let's talk about the different anatomic landmarks that we have in this view. In blue is going to be your muscles as well as your spinous process. Remember again that when you touch the back of your neck, that hard bone that you feel, that's going to be the tip of that spinous process. So this is all going to be in the back of your neck. The disc is here outlined in orange. If you remember, the disc is going to be the rubbery cushion between the vertebrae. This next landmark is one of the most important landmarks that we have when we're looking at MRIs, and that's called the foramen. What the foramen is, it's the hole in the vertebrae whereby your nerve exits your spinal canal and then goes down to specific areas of your arm. And what you're able to see is that there is a space between the edge of the spinous process and lamina versus where the disc is. And it's in this red area where the nerve exits the spinal canal, which is here, and then goes down your arm. If you have a smaller foramen on one side or the other, it can cause nerve pinching, which can cause cervical radiculopathy and pain for people. Lastly, the spinal cord is here in green. If you look closely, it has a kidney bean type shape, and outside of it is spinal fluid, which we see surrounding it on all sides. If we're able to see spinal fluid surrounding the spinal cord at all sides, and the foramen are widely open, it is very unlikely that a patient could be having symptoms from that particular area. Well, what are some of the common complaints that I hear from patients who have some issues in their neck? They could be describing just arm pain, just neck pain. Usually though, a patient has a combination of both arm pain and neck pain. But let's talk about some of the diagnoses that can cause either or or both of these complaints. Degenerative disc disease is something that can cause purely neck pain because of the normal age-appropriate degeneration of the discs, which can then cause bone spurs and arthritis in the back of the neck. 
Scoliosis is a curvature of the spine, which can cause muscular imbalances that can also cause exclusively neck pain. Kyphosis is a specific type of scoliosis where you have your chin falling down onto your chest and you have difficulty lifting your head up. That can commonly cause pain in the neck exclusively. But then there's this black box. Frequently, there are many patients who have neck pain and we don't have an anatomic reason why they hurt. That does not mean that they don't have pain. It just means that we're not able to see it on any advanced imaging like an MRI. And unfortunately, there may not be any surgical treatment that can help them with their discomfort. With regards to arm pain though, Shoulder issues can commonly cause patients who have pain that go into the arm that can frequently be confused with having a neck issue. And lastly, a peripheral neuropathy, something like carpal tunnel syndrome, can cause symptoms of numbness and tingling into the hand that are commonly seen in patients who have neck issues as well. But there are a couple diagnoses that can cause both neck and arm pain that we're going to be talking about. Cervical radiculopathy is one, and cervical myelopathy is another. Today we're going to be talking about cervical myelopathy, also known as dysfunction of the spinal cord as a result of physical compression. What are the symptoms of cervical myelopathy? This is the most common cause of spinal cord impairment. These cause subtle symptoms that you may not notice, but as time goes on, they can worsen. People describe balance issues, I've had patients come to me saying that over the course of three to six months, they've gone from walking around normally to utilizing a cane, then a walker, and then eventually a wheelchair because the progression has been so quick. Patients also talk about diminished hand dexterity or problems doing spine motor tasks with their fingers, such as buttoning buttons to a shirt, uh, putting jewelry on, or picking up coins off of a table. Eventually, as this goes on, they've also experienced things like strength loss, particularly in their lower extremities or in their hands. This is also accompanied at times with sensory loss or issues with numbness and tingling either in the hands, feet, or both. Ultimately, though, as time goes on, a certain percentage of patients do experience functional decline, which we define as needing assistance for your activities of daily living. What is the cause of cervical myelopathy? Let's go back to what our normal MRI of our cervical spine looks like, and let's look at some of the subtleties here. Now, if you remember, the spinal cord is going to be here in gray, and on either side of the spinal cord is this white area, and this white area on either side is spinal fluid. This gives nutrients to the spinal cord to make sure it's healthy. But as time goes on, and as people age, they may start experiencing things like disc bulging. As you can see here, this disc bulging can take away some of that spinal fluid buffer and can actually start encroaching upon the spinal cord at not just one area, but sometimes different areas as well. In some patients, this disc bulging can actually become calcified or turned into bone, which can make it much more dangerous as well. In addition to this, they can also have some ligament thickening in the back part of the spinal cord. And that's what we're seeing here with this red stripe. So between disc bulging and ligament thickening, you can see how there can be a significant decrease in the space for the spinal cord within the spinal canal. Ultimately though, if this compression becomes severe, you can start seeing some spinal cord swelling, and that's manifested as this white line within the spinal cord. If you have an MRI and it has a white area in it, that means there's already been some spinal cord damage. So let's take a look at what normal looks like. And again, this is our normal spine over here on the left. Remember, this is the side view. So you have the front over here with where your mouth and throat are, and this white over here is going to be the skin of the back of your neck. But if you look closely, there's not much compression of the spinal cord at all. You're able to see white on either side of the spinal cord, signifying plenty of space within the spinal canal for the spinal cord, which is in gray. Now you contrast that with what a spinal cord looks like that is stenotic or narrowed. And this is an MRI of that here. So if you look closely, this spinal cord looks much different than this spinal cord here. You're not able to see any of this white 
in this area up here, way up close to the brainstem, or way down here. So it looks like in this small area here, there's not much space for the spinal cord. How I like to describe spinal cord dysfunction to patients is I like to compare the spinal cord to I-75, for example. So way up here, where you have no spinal cord compression, you can think of I-75 as having eight lanes. And also way down here, you have eight lanes on the highway. But in this small area here, it may only be two. So there becomes a traffic jam of sorts. So when your brain tries to send signals from your brain down to your hands or feet, it gets slowed up in this area. And as a result of it slowing up, you start having problems with stumbling or dropping things. Ultimately though, cervical myelopathy is a space issue. There is just not enough space for this patient's spinal cord to adequately send signals from the brain to other parts of the body. Unfortunately today, there are no medications which can fix this structural problem. How did this happen though? Well, compression of the spinal cord is what we in the spine community call stenosis or narrowing of the spinal canal. Stenosis can cause cervical myelopathy, but not always. Severity is related to the amount of physical compression of the spinal cord. Many patients ask me, will I get better from this? This is a hard answer, and the answer is possibly. A lot of it depends on how severe your symptoms were earlier. But let's take a closer look at what the progression of cervical myelopathy could be. So here's a graph that we've put together. On the y-axis here, this is disability. So the higher you go on this axis, the more disabled you are. And over here on the x-axis, this is time. So the further you go along this way, the longer time is. Cervical myelopathy does not follow this linear trend that just goes straight up like some other diseases. Cervical myelopathy, on the other hand, has a very different way of progression. It's more of a stepwise progression. So you can be doing fine, doing fine, doing fine, and then boom, you're all of a sudden going to have a functional decline that you'll notice. Then you'll start getting better from that, and then it'll hit again. Start getting a little bit better, and then you'll get another hit. So you have this staircase type design here. Now what you'll see though, is that you have these areas here where you have a little bit of a plateau or some improvement. And you have them all throughout this graph that we see here. The problem is in certain patients, we don't know the time period for this plateau or improvement phase. For some patients, it can be a matter of months. In some patients, it can be a matter of years. That's why it's very important for you to be followed closely if you're having signs or symptoms of cervical myelopathy. What we have seen in some patients is that 20 to 60% of patients with mild signs of cervical myelopathy do see some sort of neurologic deterioration as time goes on, but not everybody. How should I be treated if I have signs or symptoms of early cervical myelopathy? Well, the first step should be getting a thorough physical exam to look at your strength, coordination, and reflexes. Many times we would like to have a baseline MRI of the neck to see the extent of compression and the amount of areas involved. Occasionally this can involve the mid-back as well because the spinal cord extends from the base of the skull to the bottom of your rib cage. Serial physical exams or check-ins should be done from time to time to figure out if symptoms are stable or worsening. If symptoms worsen over time, especially quickly, surgical treatment should be strongly considered. But is there an option other than surgery? As of right now, unfortunately not really. This is an architectural or a structural problem. There is simply not enough space for the spinal cord within the spinal canal. Patients can certainly try therapy to work on their balance or coordination, but the progression of cervical myelopathy cannot be changed with these measures. Key here is going to be early surgical treatment if there are worsening of symptoms over time or if symptoms are very severe to begin with. Now, if it ever does come down to surgery, what are our goals? The goal of surgery is to create more space for your spinal canal, thereby decompressing the spinal cord and opening up that traffic jam that we were talking about on I-75 to allow proper transmission of signals from your brain to the rest of your body. The goal of this surgery though is to halt any progression of symptoms. 
So if we're able to press pause on how you are at the time of surgery and you don't get any worse as your life goes on, that's considered a win. Any improvement that you get is considered a bonus. There are a subset of patients who do get improvements as time goes on, but it's difficult to predict who those patients are going to be preoperatively. About a third of patients do see improvements following surgery for cervical myelopathy. Of those patients, we do find that those that do better tend to be younger, they have early symptoms when they undergo surgery, and they are not smokers and not diabetics. Well, what are the surgical options if I want to choose them? We can perform surgery through the front of the neck or the back of the neck. Surgery through the front or anterior can involve an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Surgery can also be performed through the back of the neck. These two different kinds of surgeries involve a cervical laminoplasty, which is motion sparing, or a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion. If you're interested in learning more about these surgical options, please click in the links below for those educational videos. Thank you. Okay, so there you have it. Today you've learned about the anatomy, causes, symptoms, and treatment plan for cervical myelopathy. Remember that for many people with early signs of cervical myelopathy, a certain percentage of them will get worse as time goes on. So it is important to establish with a spine surgeon or a neurologist if you are experiencing some of these subtle signs or symptoms that we outlined earlier in this video. At a minimum, someone with early signs of cervical myelopathy should be watched, and if symptoms worsen as time goes on, there should be an honest discussion with the surgeon about surgical treatments to remedy the problem. If you or someone you love may be having signs or symptoms of cervical myelopathy and you would like to have a consultation with me, please see our phone number below. Or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. You can also find me on these other platforms here. And if you're on YouTube, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about future educational videos such as these. Take care.